Hi everybody, welcome back to part four of our Organic Chemistry to Primer lessons. We're going to talk about lesson 4.3 today, and this is continuing our discussion of the reactions that conjugated dienes can do that are different from what we saw for isolated alkenes in section three. And the reaction we're going to talk about here is the Diels-Alder reaction. The Diels-Alder reaction is what is called a four plus two cycloaddition reaction. We haven't talked about those types of reactions before. Cycloaddition indicates we're going to add two things and get a cyclic compound. The four plus two part tells us how many atoms are in the pi conjugated segments or the pi bonding segments that react to make the cycle. So you see there are four atoms here in the pi conjugated system. That's the four plus the two carbons in that pi bond. So the four plus two comes from that. Well, how does this reaction work? Well, in our last lesson, we talked about one, two versus one, four addition products. The diels alder reaction is a 1,4 addition product. You don't have to decide if it's 1,2 or 1,4. The dienophile, the thing that reacts with the diene, this is the diene because it's got two alkenes, which you call a diene. The dienophile adds to the 1 and 4 positions of the diene. So you see these two carbons. They've got hydrogens on them. But one of these carbons will end up attached to carbon number 4, as you can see here. These are the two carbons that were in the dienophile. One of them attaches to carbon four, and one of them attaches to carbon one. So it's a one, four addition. Adds them to carbon number one and four. Well, how does this reaction take place if we think about the diene and the dienophile? Well, it's actually a very simple reaction. It's concerted, which you remember will mean it all happens in one step. It's pericyclic, which means that all the orbitals overlap in a cyclic fashion at the same time. So my arrows have to go in kind of a cyclic fashion. Well, how do we figure out where the arrows are, what the mechanism is? Well, we already have the product, so we see that we're going to make a bond here. We're also going to make a bond here. So we need to make this a cyclohexene ring at the end. This pi bond is gone. You see in the product is a single bond. So we're going to cross out one of those bonds. We also don't have the double bonds here and here that we had in the starting material. So that's going to go away and that's going to go away. But we get a new double bond here between what used to be a single bond here. So we need to have a bond here. When you sort of think through your mechanism like this and you cross out the bonds that need to go away, you draw dotted lines where you need to make new bonds, you know you have to take an arrow away from any bond that breaks. It has to go somewhere. The two electrons must not just disappear into thin air. And if you draw them going to a spot where you need a bond, that will provide the electrons needed for that bond that should be made in the reaction. And if we do that in a cyclic fashion, since we said it was a pericyclic reaction earlier in our discussion, we'd have a mechanism that looks like this. All right, so the product would then be like this, double bond here. That arrow says we put the electrons in this space to make the double bond. And we've made the two new bonds here and here from this arrow and this arrow. All right, so we've made the two new bonds and we don't have a double bond here. We've accounted for all the changes in bonding from the starting materials to the product. And that's the mechanism for the Diels-Alder reaction. One thing I'm going to point out is that the conjugated diene has to be in this sort of C-shaped conformation that's referred to as S-cis. Now, you can draw out the same diene in the zigzag fashion instead. right? But you need the C-shape so that you can eventually put it into part of a ring structure. This is going to make a cycle. So you might even see a starting material drawn out like this if you're doing quizzes or exams or doing some research work in this area. But remember, you can rotate around single bonds. So even if I have it drawn like this, it's free to rotate to make this conformation provided there's enough thermal energy around. So the S-cis conformation of the conjugated diene. And here I have two different dienophiles, two different alkenes to react with it. And it's very important to remember this is a concerted mechanism. So when I have a concerted mechanism, everything happens at the same time. There aren't intermediates where stuff can rotate around and rearrange. So if I have these two alkene groups cis to one another in my starting material, I'll redraw the starting material here, and I take my conjugated diene, and I do my diels alder reaction like I showed on the previous page. This is concerted and I lead to a product like this, it becomes important which way these groups are pointing because I've created two chiral centers. And you know when you have a cycloalkane, you have the potential for cis and trans isomers. 
Well, this is a concerted reaction, and these two start off pointing the same way. So in the product, they're also going to point the same way. They could both point towards us, or they could both point away from us. And you have to think whether you're going to have a difference in these two compounds. Are they identical, or are they different? Well, if R1 is not the same as R, you don't have any mirror plane here, right? I've, I've indicated these are R and R1 to say they're different from each other. So we don't have a meso compound. We have two distinct stereoisomers, but they must both be the cis isomers because of the concerted nature of the reaction. So we get each of these two stereoisomers in equal amount. That is a racemic mixture. Similar thought process if we do the reaction where we use the trans isomer. We first think about the general diels alder reaction. We have the R1 and the R. We have the same arrow pushing. Right? We only involve the carbons that have double bonds. These are sort of extraneous decorations at this point. You can just go ahead and sketch in your core and track that these two atoms came from the alkene, the dienophile as it's called in this type of work. And you see it's a concerted mechanism and the R and the R1 are point opposite directions. There's no chance to rearrange between starting material and products. We're going to get trans distribution of the R1 and R from one another in the product as well. But we could also switch which of these is the wedge and which is the hash line. So that would be the enantiomer. I'll just write plus enantiomer. And that means that with an equal amount of each of those, we'll have again a racemic mixture. So we started with a chiral starting materials when we got a chiral product, you'll always get a racemic mixture in such cases. One thing you'll notice in the general diels alder reaction is that the electrons are being pulled from the alkene at one end, and they're being pushed onto the alkene, right, towards this alkene from here to make a bond to this carbon on the other side. So putting different groups that either attract or repel electrons on the alkene could assist the reaction to go faster or slow it down. The general rule is that electron-poor dienophiles lead to faster Diels-Alder reactions. The Diels-Alder reaction is facilitated by such electron-poor groups. How do I identify electron-poor groups? Well, it just is something that will pull electrons away, so there's a partial plus charge close to the alkene. So you see a partial plus charge here, minus, so the partial plus is close to the alkene. That means that the overall group is referred to as an electron withdrawing group because you have a pull of electrons on the group that's reacting. And if we think about the reaction, you say, okay, the electrons are being pulled towards this carbon. There's this partial plus that sort of helps line things up. These electrons will be pushed here and these will go here. So it's not going to change your mechanism. It's just going to mean that the reaction will be a little bit faster than if that CN group wasn't there. And again, in this particular deals all reaction, we've created a chiral center, so we'd expect to see 50% of the R configuration and 50% of the S. That's the definition of a racemic mixture. Same thing here. I've actually already drawn in the structure for you in your notes. But again, we would expect a racemic mixture for this. And then you have these types of problems where instead of being given the two starting materials and being asked for the product or trying to figure out the product yourself, Maybe something that's a little bit more real world for doing research is usually you're thinking, oh, I'd like to make this, but what kind of starting materials do I need? And you might even have to plan which type of reaction you want to use to make this. If you see that a compound has a cyclohexene in it, you think, well, I know that the Diels Alder reaction is really good at very easily making alkene. Then you have to think backwards to think, well, how do I pick the pieces that have to go together to make this particular? cyclohexene with, with this stuff on. Well, I always like to think back to the very, very simplest version of a reaction I can think of, and that would be what we talked about on our very first page of the diels alder reaction. So, okay, if I try to do a diels alder reaction, and I want to think of the simplest structure, I have a 1,4 addition product, which means that carbon number 4 and carbon number 1 were the ones at the end of the diene here. That would be these two in the product. That means that between carbons 2 and 3, that's where the double bond will form. Okay, well let me look at my more complicated situation. The double bond in a diels alder reaction ends up between carbons 2 and 3. And I know where carbons 1 and 4 are by comparison. So, oh, that piece, the piece that ends up with a double bond right there, has to be in the starting material 
from the diene. It's kind of thinking backwards. One, two, three, four. Okay, so then what about this other piece? Right, I overall have six carbons that form the ring, so maybe I number these five and six. So, okay, where do those come from in the initial starting material I'm looking at? Well, if I look over here at my really simple one again, right, one, two, three, four, if I number these five and six, say, well, where do I get carbon five and six from the starting material? It's right here, five and six. So I have to have a double bond between carbons five and six to start, and the product it ends up being a single bond. Okay, so carbons 5 and 6 here have to come from the alkene. Well, what about all this junk? Well, we've seen some examples where you can have a substituent coming off of the double bond. Like here, we have this aldehyde. So, okay, well, that just really means that I need this stuff, that little piece there, attached to my alkene. So, okay, well, that is a double bond O, O, Double bond O, right, that's the piece I circled. And it's attached to carbons 5 and 6 like that. So this is a pretty elaborate looking molecule, right, compared to a lot of the things we see in our first year organic chemistry. But if you think backwards that way and just say, well, where do the pieces have to attach to end up where they are on the product, that's how you figure out this retrosynthetic analysis. Retrosynthetic meaning you're given the product and you're thinking kind of backwards to say, what would I need to get there? Another thing I want to point out is that if you think back to section 3 in the book, we saw a lot of reactions that alkenes can do. Alkynes can also do, right? So if I had an alkene, and you don't want to necessarily write this in your box A here, but remember that if I took HCl and added it to an alkene, you'd get the Cl and the H added like that. If I did the same thing with an alkyne, you say, oh, the pi bond is the same thing, whether it's a pi bond, an alkene, or an alkyne, I'll end up with a Cl and an H here. And you could then add again because you still have a pi bond. But the point is that the alkene and the alkyne both have pi bonds that can move around and react in very similar ways. So what you can do is, instead of having an alkene react with your diene, you can start with an alkyne. So, okay, and the arrows go in this paracyclic fashion. You have a cyclic overlap of things in the transition state. So, well, what will my product be? Well, I can think by looking at the arrows that I'm given here, I'm going to need to make a bond here because I'm showing electrons being poured into that space, right? So I have that. I broke that bond. I broke that bond, and I made a new bond here and here. Right? You're always going to make a cyclohexane type structure. Six membered ring. It's a four plus two cycloaddition. One, two, three, four. The other two carbons are going to number five and six. But you had three bonds here to start and you took one of them away. So two of those bonds are still there. And then what about these, these ester groups hanging off? Well, they're still hanging off. And you'll have to draw them out kind of like this. And you don't have any chiral centers here because remember that if you have a sp2 hybridized carbon, a carbon in a double bond, it only has three groups on it. So we didn't make any chiral centers here. So we just have one product that looks like this. The other kind of starting materials that sometimes confuse people with these Diels Alder reactions are reactions where the conjugated diene piece has this other stuff coming off it, these two carbons here. So how do we handle that? Well, the way you handle this is you number only the carbons that are in double bonds in your conjugated diene. And then we've been numbering these five and six, right? So we can start to do that. I would say just ignore that this is even here to start with and say, okay, I know that every Diels Alder reaction with an alkene and a diene makes this structure where I have one, two, three, four, five, and six. And anything else is just adding the substituents on, right? Even when we had to think backwards, we were able to say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, those are sort of the important pieces that make this ring. Anything else is kind of just a piece that hangs off that I've got to fill in after the fact. Right, so we have these two sort of pieces we can think about putting together. So what does that mean for this particular problem? Well, we have to say what's attached to the stuff. There's nothing attached to carbon 5 and 6, so those are kind of done. But carbon 1 and 4 are linked to each other by this sort of ribbon, this chain. So you say, okay, I have, let's just label these A and B, carbon A and B link carbon 1 and 4. 
So I need to draw carbon A, carbon B, attached to carbon 4. That looks kind of sloppy, but that is the right product. And if you see someone draw this out with a computer program, which you usually do in a textbook, and we have some examples of this in the primer, it looks something like this. It's not super easy to draw by hand, but this is carbon A and B. These are carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So you can see it looks like a weird shape, but if you do your thought process and figure out where the pieces go, it's kind of a doable problem. And the same thing down here, I've changed the ring size for my diene over here. But if I say, okay, it's a diels alder reaction, I'm going to make my cyclohexene. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And say, well, what's this little piece here, that little triangle piece sticking out? It's only one carbon, and that one carbon links carbon 1 to carbon 4. So carbon 1 to 4, there's that carbon right there that links them together. And again, there's a more correct sort of geometric way to show this. The molecule shape is a little more like this than what I've drawn over here. But again, you can find these pieces and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right, if you remember in the diels alder reaction, you always make the double bond from carbons 2 to 3. It helps when you see drawings like this to be able to figure out the pieces that had to go together to make it. And that's about all I want to say in the lecture portion about our diels alder reactions. You want to read, of course, the lesson, and there's one more piece in the lesson about endo versus exo products that's explained pretty well in the reading. But this shows you how to figure out most of the diels alder type reactions you'll see in the attendant problems and homework we have with the course.